So uh, what are we going to do here today? We're going to take a look at the uh, at the surficial geology of Wellesley. We're going to take a walk around the Bates School, Boulder Brook area, and uh, and see evidence of glacial lakes, of of kettle holes that were left behind by chunks of ice. We're going to see glacial erratics that were dropped uh, in the middle of the fields here. And we're going to see uh, weathering against a big cliff of Dedham granite, uh, where we can see some of the rocks that were, uh, that were plucked. And we're going to see the now dry lake bed of Glacial Lake Charles. How did you guys decide on this spot to, uh, to explore today? Uh, there's just so much, there's so much richness kind of in a, in a walkable loop in this area where you can see the glacial, evidence of the glacial lake, you can see the kettle hole, you see some, some of the most striking uh, uh, erratics in Wellesley, uh, as well as a really neat cliff face. Yeah, and my kids went to bait school, so <laughs> perfect. <laughs> right here uh, to split those continents apart again. So for a while, Africa is right against us. It begins to uh, begins to split apart. When it does, these intrusions of of, uh, of gray rock uh, of diabase um, come up through the granite, and you can see them all through Wellesley. Wherever you're looking at the bed of granite, you can also also see this rock that came through as the as the land was trying to come apart and it was trying to decide exactly where it was going to split. Luckily for us, it didn't end up splitting here it ended up splitting in what is now the middle of the Atlantic Ocean so the African plates and the North American plates came apart again and Avalonia stayed with the North American plate and that's why we we are here right now that's how it came to be that was about 200 million years ago that this spreads apart again go through a long period of those mountains eroding away and then we got into the it we get into the ice age and Last time, Mike had a Mike had a uh, 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 map also of the bedrock in Wellesley. He then said, "But don't look at this too closely. This is more for discussion because all of what I just told you was not really what was on that map. They had they had put that map together right as somebody was saying, "Hey, plate tectonics, maybe that's a thing." And other geologists were saying, "No, that's not a thing." So so that map. They made lots of kind of errors in what they were, what they thought they were seeing, um, and so the science has improved, and hopefully we can get we can get another map sometime soon. This map actually is is better in that regard, mm -hmm. as, as I think I forget who it was that said the surficial stuff doesn't change, it changes somewhat, and the reasons for it change, but a lot of this is uh, is pretty accurate, um, and. Uh, Mike, do you want to do you want to take us through the? Uh... Yeah, so I'll do this. We're gonna we 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 we'll, we'll walk it. So we'll talk as we walk. But I'll I'll give you the first broad picture. Uh, basically, th all of this is covered in, in a mile or two of ice. Believe it or not, here, right here, mile or two of ice, and uh, it's really heavy. It's so heavy, in fact, that it depresses the surface. This where we are now, a couple hundred feet above sea level. Uh, we were we were below a couple hundred feet below sea level. And um, and when and so that's all this is covered in ice, a couple miles of ice thick. Then went and all the way down to Cape Cod, as I was explaining earlier, uh, Long Island, Cape Cod. Here, you know, southern Rhode Island. Uh, actually, the southern terminus would be the Elizabeth Islands. Uh, so, um, and then it, you know, there's this huge weight. That glacier is filled with boulders and gra boulders the size of houses. We're going to see one and. Um, and, and gravel and sand and silt, and, you know, goes on and on. Everything's in that, it's just loaded. I, you've seen pictures of glaciers, they're, often they take a picture of the white section, but the look on the edges, it's, it's, it's dirty with, with gravel and so on. And, um, and so the glacier, what happens here is the glacier about, so that's 25,000 years, so that glaciation all started two and a half million years ago. On and off, on and on, on and off. Um, but the way to think about it is that here we were covered in ice for two and a half million years, and then 25,000 years ago it starts to melt back. So first thing to melt is uh, uh, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, the Elizabeth Islands, the southern shore. Forget if that's Montauk, Orient Point, but whichever one's the southern one. That's the 
at 25,000 years ago, that's where the edge of the glacier is. It starts to melt back in some fashion, controversial, uh, probably actually zigzagging back and forth as it melts back. You know, it's a little bit forward, you know, one step forward, two steps melting backward. And um, eventually has melted all the way back to here, to uh, Wellesley, at about 14,000 years ago. Okay, now just for context, 14,000 years ago sounds like a lot. I think I did a little math, it's 600 generations or something. Um, but there were Native Americans living here um, on the edge of that, they were hunting caribou on the tundra at the foot of this glacier. So when, this, when the glacier had finally melted back to, let's say right there, this was tundra and there were Native Americans, and I'm not making that up, there's actually archeological finds all along that show that at about that period of time, there were Native Americans hunting caribou. Uh, and so um, those were our early settlers here in Wellesley. And uh, so the glacier is just melting back. I should point out, by the way, the glacier, when it pushed forward, pushed forward, it was kind of, there was a, it, it did it kind of like finger lobes. And so here there was a lobe that, that kind of, it didn't go straight from north to south. It kind of, for whatever reasons going on in Canada, or upper New England, it curved around and was heading heading this direction. And then when it melted back, it, you know, I, who knows how it melted back. Um, but it melted back this way generally. Now, uh, we're not gonna see this today, but some of the uh, characteristics of a glacier when it melts back, what do you find? You find drumlins. So if you can see these, these pink oval shapes here, these are drumlins, Marcus Hill is one of them. Uh, it, there's seven or eight of them. I forgot how many. Babson is on. Babson's a big one. Babson is yeah. on one. The edge of Wellesley College. If you if you see the the hill there as you're as you're going past the edge of Wellesley College in Wellesley Square, that's a that's a drumlin. Right there. That one right there. The, there's yeah. a drumlin uh, by uh, Southgate. I think it is this the the uh, cemetery on on Brook Street, and then the back of that is. Southgate. Uh, Wait, define drumlin again. So a drumlin is a big oval, a big oval, like Babson, Babson College. If you go up that hill, that hill is a drumlin. And when Mike was talking about, uh, if, before some of you may have got here, that a, a glacier is bulldozing all this, these boulders and, and gravel and silt and sand and, and everything in front of it. When that melts back, for reasons they don't completely understand, underneath that glacier, there'll be, there'll be piles of oval uh, uh, stuff mounded, you know, really high um, uh, that that get left behind. And uh, yeah, and a good point is that when a glacier melts back, sometimes it leaves drumlins. It leaves a lot of outwash from uh, ice contact, outwash deposits that are just, you know, as the water streaming, melting off of this glacier from underneath the glacier and on top of the glacier, gravel and sand is just coming out in these deltas. And that's actually really important for what we're gonna to see today. We're not gonna see any drumlins for some reason. They're only on the, the other side of the tracks. Um, uh, there are drumlins further north. I think, I think there are some on the map, but I couldn't find them right now. But we have a drumlin field. And that typically drumlins are in fields um, and uh, you know, collections of them. So, but no one really understands the mechanism. <coughs> this seems to be, in fact, when they bore holes in them, they see that what it looks like is the glacier uh, uh, pulled back and there's a little drumlin and then it, the glacier because it gets a little colder out for a few hundred years the glacier goes back across it pulls back again now it's a little higher and it's instead of being a veneer of gravel and dirt and, and, and sand it's a hill but here on this side of Wellesley on top of the Dedham on this side of the tracks um, thank god we have those tracks <laughs> um, and uh over here, and see X is where we are now. Uh, it's there are no drumlins, but instead it's a veneer of gravel and boulders and things that were left behind, called a till. So we're going to mainly be looking at till. Is that, is that yes, is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, some other things that get left behind are eskers. We have a couple of eskers in here. Um, one or, I think down has two or three, um, and those are places where the under uh, under the glacier on top of the, of the bedrock, there were maybe a stream system. 
and uh, and in that stream system there's a mound of of uh, sand and those are sinuous long serpentinite serpentine uh, shaped uh, things that maybe form the same way as drumlins but have more velocity in them so they don't mound up who knows um, so anyhow we're going to be looking mostly at till and uh there's, and there's well a few, there's a few other things that, yes that importantly so so one i don't know if this is the one you're thinking of but another thing that gets left behind are these giant chunks of ice so that the glacier doesn't all just melt mm. as one here's the edge and it melts back sometimes for whatever reason big pieces get left behind and they get left behind it can be for hundreds of years it's not that it's not that oh it didn't melt this summer it's going to melt next summer it maybe it got covered by something so now it's insulated and you're at the edge of the glacier so it's right at the boundary of are you going to melt or are you not going to melt it can sit there for for a hundred years now it's getting covered by that outwash that mike was so it's getting more and more insulated so that ice is is dropping down into that into that muck and it and all around it is getting covered by by soil when it finally does melt away it leaves what's called a kettle hole and there can be big ones uh there can be uh you know lakes that are that are uh kettle holes uh we're going to see a small one uh as one of the first things we're going to see um right next to the, the parking lot by kelly field um and uh and so that's one of the things we'll see kettles and you, often with kettles you see caves. we talked about the drumlins which are these giant hills but you'll see kind of uneven uh surface around it which are, which are till that's not laid out all evenly it's uh for some for one reason or another it, it leaves piles and so it's came with a k or a c k is with a k k a m hmm. we left out the most the most fun thing that happens when a glacier melts back is that um in front of it or or at at the toe of it you know where it's left a lake will form and you've seen that in pictures of all kinds of glaciers where there's a lake now, uh, if it's not, you know, if it's not coming down into the ocean, you'll see uh, a lake. And those are called proglacial lakes. Uh, they tend to be um, temporary, but only in the sense of lasting a couple thousand years. Uh, eventually, something causes them to drain off. But they're trapped on the southern side. They're trapped by mounds of glacial debris and maybe the topography. And then on the north side, they're trapped by the glacier. And much of the town was covered in a lake for a couple thousand years, certainly a thousand years. Uh, again, one of those things we don't know a whole lot about yet, but certainly a thousand years plus, uh, called Glacial Lake Charles. And eventually, some dam down here broke and it drained off into the, uh, into the Charles River. Or maybe, potentially, the glacier moved back far enough and it drained off into the Sudbury River. You know, it's hard to figure out. And in, 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 in the thinking about how uh, proglacial lakes happen and don't happen is changing rapidly, uh, as I see the literature. Uh, as LIDAR uh, helps people understand better what the actual sand deposits are that were left behind on the edges of these. Anyhow, Glacial Lake Charles, you're right now standing on its, uh, on its bottom. And you might say, okay, Mike, really, is there any way to see that? Well, stop and think for a second. We're gonna go. We're gonna go out in the street. Yeah. This, so this might be a good time. Let's, let's actually, do it. Let's go. Actually, go. Do you want to? Yeah. Oh, please. Uh, what's the what's the what's known or what's the belief about why climate changed over those billions of years and brought the glaciers in and out? Why did they come in? Why did they melt? So, um, it's the uh, it's the it's the big controversial question there's not i i subscribe to a number of geology uh professional geology magazines and there's not an issue where the, the question of why did we glaciate starting two and a half million now it's not the first time that the earth or north america glaciated it, it happened back uh, actually when uh chris was describing the westboro uh it might not have been a warm tropical black sand beach it might have been a cold it might have been more like you know iceland you know Black Sand Beach, um, but um, and so one of the things you might have heard about is Snowball Earth. There's a thought that there might have been two Snowball Earths where the Earth was so glaciated. This is 600, a billion years ago, uh, two times that the Earth was so glaciated that um, that maybe even the oceans were frozen over. 
that the earth was so cold. But then we got in pretty warm conditions. You know, the Eocene, which is 50 million years ago, um, after the, you know, after the asteroid hit and the dinosaurs disappeared and mammals were starting to really show up, uh, temperatures on the globe heated up to being, now remember now, the whole, before I give you the number, global warming so far, it's been pretty benign so far, really. I mean, you hear a lot of people worrying about what we're seeing today, but it's nothing compared to what we need to worry about. Because um, the, the temperature rise since 1850 is only two degrees Fahrenheit. You know, which if you think about your thermostat in your house, you, you all day long you're moving it around to get you know, that extra two or less degrees. Uh, so the whole global warming so far is only two degrees. The EOC, 50 million years ago, was 25 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today. Wow. <laughs> the Earth was a tropical steam bath all the time. And I got to tell you, you might not have liked the kinds of organisms that existed then. You might not want those today, but it was, organisms loved it. I mean, particularly, you know, amphibians, you know, things you could imagine, amphibians, mosquitoes. <laughs> and so, you know, we kind of don't want to go back there, but, but it happened. And then what happened since then, that 50 million years ago, and I forget if it's 50 or 55, but we gradually started to cool down, down. Down, but the Earth wasn't down. any more farther or closer to the sun, no. right? The Probably sun was that does have an effect. And, I'll, and, and I'll, I'll, when we talk about the last two and a half million years, I'll mention that. But that big drawdown, drop down, uh, it's very controversial. Why? Different theories. One is that it may have been carbon monoxide might have been sequestered by other. First of all, the the, the continents were different places, and the kinds of mountains that were happening in different places. Uh, one of the thoughts is that the formation of the Himalayas is why we got cold. Uh -huh. So, but, you know, the, I'm just not a geochemist. I mean, there's a whole geochemical, right, right. complicated, just, you know, sort of an explanation for why that could be. But certainly the configuration of the surface and the oceans, the, the way the oceans flowed, and it was all very different. All very different. So it's but thought that... they have that, measured atmospheric carbon in those... What's that? They have measured atmospheric carbon in some of those air time frames. Yes, you can. And there that are techniques. Is, that accounts for the warming. Yes. It happened more slowly. Cool. Yes. Yeah, carbon dioxide is definitely, uh, methane and carbon dioxide are definitely, have been the culprits even so in. So, atmosphere is the, atmosphere sort of the answer. answer. Well, atmosphere is the answer, but why does the atmosphere change? So, uh, yeah. And, but, yeah. 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 And, and so then, go well, two and a half million years ago, we should go walking, but two and a half million years ago, uh, there have been. The glaciation has come and gone, come and gone multiple times. Uh, not necessarily all the way back to, to Greenland, but it has gone back. So here, for example, I oversimplified by saying we were covered in a glacier, but the glacier that left all of this is called the Wisconsin. And that only started 200,000 years ago, peaked out at 25,000 years ago. But there was one before that that covered this called the Illinois. And before that, there was others. They give them names, you know, multiple ones. They used to think there were five, but now they think there were dozen. So this has actually been scoured. Our landscape here has been scoured maybe a dozen times. Uh, but the one that left the soil and the sand that you see today has been dated as Wisconsin. And no one's found anything older than that. If you go to Missouri, you can actually find a place where the Illinois, like the arch, the arch is built on Illinoisan so uh, gravel. The Wisconsin had never got far enough not down to, to scour it away. like this, where, where it's flat, and, and if this house wasn't here, you could see all the way back through that field that's flat. And you'll see that, that it, it's flat, and then it rises into a, into a, uh, into a terrace, and then maybe it's, it's a little bit higher. And you'll see the same thing if you're in Natick, and you'll see the same thing if you're in Dover. And that's, and that's, what, uh, that's where the glacial lake covered, it didn't just cover Wellesley, it covered a huge area around here. And so in all those towns, you'll see at the same elevation, you'll see these flat areas. And so Weston Road is flat and that's all bed of, of glacial Lake Charles. This area here is all 
bed of, of glacial Lake Charles, when you go down Route 16 and it's so flat, the reason that that's flat is because there was a lake there for a thousand years, for 2,000 years, and the sediments were, uh, were flat. And they, they think that the reason it's terraced is, is that there were, there were different stages. It's 2,000 years, it wasn't the same lake boundary that whole time. So it was, it was at, at different levels at, at different periods. And that's, you can still see that in the terrace. If I took you up there, and I'm not going to because our walk would be too long, at, right at the end of Elmwood, you've got a great example of the terracing where you're on one street and it's, everything is at exactly this level. And then you can look up and at one of the crosswalks, it goes up three feet and then the whole next neighborhood is exactly on that level. And that's, that's from, the, uh, from the glacial lake and the, different, uh, and the different levels that it was at. And it's not that it covered the whole town. Uh, and I actually, this is, I was talking with someone before, I wanted them to have a block party so that I could wander around in the, <laughs> in the houses here. I'm, I, this ridge right here looks a little too high to me. So I'm thinking that maybe there's some, there's some bedrock under there that was, was actually a border of the lake at one of the levels that it was, that it was at, but I haven't, I haven't been able to spot any bedrock, so. Wait, uh, why would you say it was bedrock? I thought you were saying like it would have been a beach. Well, so, so sometimes there's yeah. another one, there's other places where I think it was a beach. The, this comes up to a, to a crest that I, that at least I don't understand yeah. why it would fall away on, on both sides. So it's really flat it in here. Eroded? It's really, well, we, actually, I think we can see that it's eroded. Uh, why don't we, we'll, well start I think to walk and part, talk. So Bates Field is, nobody made it flat. Uh, that's, that's Mother Nature who made that flat. That's a lake no, bed. It'd be like 10,000 years ago. So the this this bridge fishing. probably is a bed. They would have been here fishing. They would have been on. So, uh, so somewhere between my guess is you know, straight out 14 and 9,000 years, years, somewhere in there, it would be where the, the glacier had just, you know, was just melting past Wellesley. Right. And you would have the, the lake against, well, against the glacier, and it would be covering this area. And then it, it stayed around this area, you know, the edge for a long time, and that's why the lake was here for so long. The Indians probably had a different name for it. They wouldn't have called it Charles. They probably called it Massachusetts Lake. Right. Okay. Right. right. Or even it would have been, you know, ten thousand years before the Massachusetts. So who knows what you know what language the, what, what they were. Got it. But there were there would have been people. Here. But there would have been people. Here. I wanted to take a minute. Proving your rich the front yard, but, but look at the uh, look at the backyard. So, so it's the uh, the the boulders that got left behind here by that glacier. You know, there's there's. I, I think I, I, I might have mentioned on the talk, I, I was walking around my neighborhood and, and almost there's almost no boulders like that around, uh, except in one neighbor's house. And I said, you know, you're so lucky you have it. And she said, oh yeah, we had our gardener bring them. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you, you can't be sure yeah. of, of what you're seeing, but that, yeah. you know, somebody would have had to really like rocks to say, can you drop yeah. those in my yeah. backyard? So that would be dead and granite. So no, that, those, those we, we can't go up there, I guess, but we're going to see some plenty of them. Well, when you walk up the path right behind these houses, though, you get a pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, so what are they made of? They're made of, uh, uh, I mean, I can't tell from here, but if we went up to it, it wouldn't surprise me if we, if one of those is Conway granite. Which means from Franconia, from, from Franconia, yes. New Hampshire. Oh, so the glacier uh, brought it down. Yeah. From if you, if okay. we could spend an afternoon, we would find stuff that's from, uh, that's from Northern Quebec. So if we want to imagine this, we have to imagine the gl glacier just like sitting there and it's not moving and that's why these things fall out. Well, th th it's not moving, but then it melts back. Yeah. When it yeah, melts it back, melt back, the rocks yeah, don't melt, they drop yeah. down, they yeah. drop. And they, yeah, those are exactly, that's exactly how it happens. So these are yeah. around. We have but your point, there's also bedrock there, I'm pretty sure. So I think that, this is a bedrock ridge. That's, 
That's what I think. Island in the lake. Yeah. Or at least a high spot at the bottom. Oh, wow. That's what I suspect, but I oh, I'll have to trump so through there at some point. Would this would be the that thing idea. that your sailboat would get. And so the rocks and the lake was after the glacier. And if we walk, if we walk, we're going to see, we're going to see that that we're going to have bedrock with. Yeah. Glacial erratics dropped right on them yeah. in the so you know in the middle of the lot. So I wonder why that giant boulder underneath our house. So as, as one uh, as one general comment that's going to apply for the for the rest of the walk, everybody be be wary of uh, poison ivy, which is around in Wellesley, and we're going to be walking off trails sometimes, like right now, mm -hmm. because right behind me, and and now we're going to we'll walk right into the woods here, is a kettle hole. So this is an example of of a block of ice that got left behind. God, I wore short pants. <laughs> and, and this is a relatively small one. So we, we were talking on the, way, on the way over here that kettle holes can be, some people, although there's, there's different theories about it, but some people claim Lake Wabin is a kettle hole. So a kettle hole can be a, an enormous thing. There, there's also theory that it's a U-shaped valley that was scraped out by the glacier. So I, I'm not sure exactly what it is. It depends on the book you read, what they, uh, what they say is Lake Wabin. But, but here's a small example of just a circular hole in the, in the ground that was a block of ice that got left behind by the glacier, got insulated for some time. So the, the glacier is pouring this, the rest of this till off of it, and, but it's not piled up there because there's a big piece of ice in the way. And so the, and, and meanwhile, it's wet, it's all mud. So the ice is, is dropping into the mud gradually over time. And that leaves a, a hole. And someone was also asking, you know, why are, why are kettle ponds filled with water? Well, their kettle holes are not all filled with water. This one, for example, is dry right now. Uh, it all depends on the water table. A lot of them were big enough and heavy enough that they are below the water table, and those are, those are filled with water. Some of them are only filled with water. If you go into the town forest, there's ones that are the vernal springs that are in there. Many of those are kettle holes that, are, that, that may only have water in them through the spring uh we get we get frogs in there i got some pictures of frogs this year from from some of those temporary uh kettle holes that that kettle ponds or vernal ponds that are kettle holes in the town forest well there's one on Hoyden, um right next to the aqueduct that's a vernal yes. pool certified vernal pool it's always got water is that a kettle hole? so that is that is a kettle hole as well that's a that's, well, that's a one that hole. would be that's low enough in the in the topography that it's at the water tables is uh manifesting itself in the lake in the pond right here and, here and, a month ago there was water in this but right. the water tables dropped we've had a little bit of a drought and all of a sudden that's dry just for um to get sort of get the, the visual because i always think earth side the beauty of earth size or geology is that you can if you know if the visual doesn't make sense to you then then you know you're right it's wrong um the, this I don't know for sure. Uh, we can we I, we didn't bring the map, but this could be. My guess is we're standing on lake bed sediments here that, or maybe not. This is probably till here. Well, who knows? I don't see a lot of bowls. Yeah, it's probably till, and um, it might have been 50 to 100 feet thick on top of the Dedham granite, on top of 
you know, Mother Earth. Uh, and um, that block of ice could have been anywhere in that, let's say it's 100 feet, it could, that block of ice that made this pond could have been, it didn't have to be sitting on top. Uh, in fact, it probably wasn't. It was probably down inside, insulated, as Chris said earlier. Uh, and like like ice house ice, uh, you know, can last all summer. This could have lasted hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's covered in, in more till. And then eventually it melts away, eventually it melts away. And then the till just collapses on itself. So it isn't like the ice, that the block of ice was necessarily visible. It could, be, it could have been anywhere in the... And I think if you drilled enough holes here and looked at the way the the way this collapsed on itself, and actually if you just drilled a hole in the middle of it, you could probably figure out how deep the ice was. There are some questions that are just too expensive to a answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so people, people like Louis Agassi, who was, a, I think, Swiss or Austrian Swiss, and he ended up with a teaching post at Harvard. When he kept, got here to New England, he started, you know, all this was cooked up right here in New England, by the way. He started noticing all the erratics and also some of the um, uh, scratch marks on the bedrock. Right. And, um, and he said, my God, that looks just like the stuff I saw at the toe of the XYZ glacier on the Matterhorn or whatever. And, but what he didn't see was was drumlins, because he happened to live during a period where glaciers were were expanding. Advancing. Where he was yeah. studying, it was where glaciers were expanding, and then there weren't any there weren't any there behind. Where where luckily or unluckily, in a period where all the glaciers are retreating from global warming. So so now we've got lots of places to study. Uh, what does it look like when a glacier retreats? And, that, and that's where they, they said, oh, look at these neat oval mounds of, of dirt and stuff and, and gravel that get left behind. So they, they, it's, a, it's a particularly rich time to study retreating glaciers. Uh, so we're, we're learning a lot about, about how this must work. While many of these rocks might have come from Conway, uh, we saw some that didn't look local from the from the street but uh because it was the black and white rock that you wouldn't you wouldn't find in the dead and granite but many of these rocks are going to look an awful lot like the cliff face that we're about to see and that's probably because these were these were plucked off of that cliff and then dropped immediately or if if they were carried maybe many of them were carried earlier but right as the glacier was was Coming for the last time, these were the last ones that got that got pulled off the cliff, and they happened to end right here. In in Wellesley, we do have lots of we do have lots of uh, exposed bedrock, and you'll rarely see like a a slope if you if you walk up here and see how how kind of angular this is at the top. It was it had two and a half million years of ice and gravel. Uh, you know, rubbing over it, so you you typically wouldn't see something this pointy right at the right at the top. Uh, you would see it you you would see it more smooth. And uh, but if you look around it, anywhere in New England, this is very this is a very common landscape in New England, uh, and common in the northern side of, of Wellswood, where you got just these things just sitting here on top. And if you look at them, they. They almost, some of them might be, some of them might be local dedum pink granite. This looks like it's got a little pink in it. Um, I mean, you'd have to really clean up, take a piece of it and look at it with a hand lens. But so, so this, this is one of the biggest erratics in, in Wellesley. There is a, and, and uh, if, you, if you want, you can actually walk around it. There is a neat, um, uh, piece on this side. Maybe we'll just we'll take the short way. But so really impressive rock, cool formation, neat, neat the way that it's um, uh, that it that it's shaped. It does have it does have some of the pink and gray. It's also got down on the side. When this when this rock was formed, there was some other 
there was some other intrusion that this happened to break off oh. right in the middle of. So there was some extremely hot rock that came up, some magma or whatever that, that came against this long after the granite had formed and intruded into the, uh, into the granite and that happens to be where it, where it broke off. And then there's, and then there's also, you know, there's other white, uh, white in there, which, uh, which is probably evidence of a, of a separate, you know, than a, than another smaller so event. So this is diabase? This is, I think this is diabase. And uh, it's a chunk of diabase in here, probably part of an intrusion. Well, there's two ways you can get a chunk of diabase. One is it intruded up, but it, yeah, so I'm guessing, I don't know, it's kind of weird. The other way it can happen is there was diabase and then the granite melted up into it and pieces of diabase fell into it. And then with a hand lens, what you look for is baked, what they call baked rims, where it, even in rocks, the granite is so hot, you know, a couple of thousand degrees Fahrenheit, that it will actually burn any pre-existing rocks. So you'd have to, I'd have to have a hand lens. It is kind of funky. That is kind of funky. Yeah, that's a neat, that's a neat <laughs> really cool. Yeah. So the fine diabase. It's possible, you haven't heard of the word xenolith? So it's possible that this was just a chunk of diabase that fell into the magma chamber, into the granite magma chamber, oh. and froze there inside it. Huh. Or, or there's just, over here on the side, there was a diabase right. dike or sill. Right, that got and, and a little off. bit of it is still, yeah, a little bit of it is still exposed. But it's, it's kind of enigmatic because it seems to end here. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a very clean little break there. Right. So that makes mm -hmm. me think that it's... Um, that it is a, a that there was maybe maybe what defined the edge of this boulder at one point was a sill and it, it tends to erode faster right, than granite that's very uh, discreet yeah yeah you don't see the baking that would happen right. if a xenolith falls down into the magma chamber and it sits there so long that the outer rim of it bakes see this thing see yeah, how clean it's it's small edges bits of black yeah that's yeah. also closer to bedrock here so we're about to to hit some cliffs and and that's actual bedrock right that you're looking at but it's also because of all the crazy kind of stuff settling out uh glacier is all melting right here you've got kettle ponds forming you know maybe that's from from ice that was left behind over here um you also have as the ice is melting you have holes forming in the ice and the water is pouring down into the holes and just dropping stuff right there. So it's not just all that the glacier drops everything where it's sitting. There'll be, there'll be points where, it, where it's concentrated because right as it was melting, that's where, that's where everything was coming through. And so you get what, what's called a kettle and cane landscape of lots of crazy little hills, which you can also find over by, um, over by Mass Bay Community College and um, and Centennial Park. There's there's areas in there which have these kind of pyramidal almost hills in them, and that's from from some process like that where the where the uh, where the rocks and the and the stuff was all concentrated right as the glacier was was melting for that last time. 
Yeah. Fake context. This is a, a quintessential New England till field. This is the thing that the that the people who first, well, not the Native Americans, but the people who tried to farm, this is the thing that they uh, encountered that was so difficult and caused them to build walls. Uh, and and the, the walls, you know, the stone walls. And I, do we have any of them out here? Yeah, yeah we, we just passed them. Oh, all right, good. Yeah. yeah we just and there's a lot of, you know, discussion among anthropologists about exactly what the walls were for. Some people say they're boundaries. Okay, that makes sense, right? Because think about it, if you're clearing your field of the boulders, you're not going to pile them in your yard. You're going to put them on the edge. It's kind of like where people put the, dis the uh, re recycling facilities right? <laughs> on the edge of town. Um, but it also is believed as a way to corral uh, uh, sheep goats, goats and sheep. Well, yeah, you, couldn't uh -huh. keep, you couldn't keep big livestock out like a horse but or in, but you could keep the smaller ones in. <laughs> Scouring this granite, which you can see through the trees here. There's a there's a great outcrop of granite here. And you see these big rocks which are right under. Now some of these, this this may be uh, glacial erratic, but this may just be frost that that took it right off that wall there that we see. So as the glacier goes over, it's grinding and grinding the rock on the other side. But on this side, there's still that sheer face that the glacier is going past and it, it flecks the rocks off that face. So that, that's why this face is actually so steep and not ground down. Like if we were on the, if we were on the other side of this, we would see a very gradual kind of build up to this to this hill and that's and that's because on that side that's what the ice did it grounded down to a rounded shape and then it comes to the top of the ridge and it plucks big boulders of granite off and it's a it it ends up looking similar to the way the frost cleaves it so my guess and mike can correct me is that is that the rocks that we're seeing right here probably were attached to the cliff when the glacier ended and then and then were split off by frost action um, that's what we see if you go to devil's slide there are there's some great examples of what looks like happens right as the glacier goes by but that one i've been told definitively is 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 frost that knocked those pieces off after the after the glacier left and I just checked my little compass, and uh, it uh, and that's south. So Chris is right; the glacier rode over that hill that way. <laughs> <laughs> I like when I'm. When yeah, I, uh, you got it. Nailed it. When I nailed it. And there's more. Uh, there's more of that. That's called a roach mutine. That 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 look where it's gradual on one side and abrupt on the other. Right. And you can see the exposed dead and granite here so it gets it gets very discolored so it could be hard to tell you have to look all over the rock to make sure but if you look at this point you see all that pink and gray and white that we're looking for right showing through and we see that it's you know it looks like it's been yeah. like it's been rounded and we look at something like that and they say well that's that's got more edges to it. it it could be that something just broke off from from an ice crack but but more likely that's a that's a not bedrock but when I see something that's that's as smooth you know and flowing as that I say that that probably was ground 
to that shape. So are these the uh, grooves from the glacier? Or Those are probably away? not. Um, so for one reason, I mean, for one thing, I would expect them to be going in this direction. Yeah, yeah, so that gives yeah. me a, but that's, that's a pretty, uh, that's not a good way to science it. Because if it, if it was going in that direction, that'd be a really neat finding. <laughs> but um, but the rocks do have lots of, lots of other reasons that they split. Um, so you, you have to be careful before you call something a, uh, a striation. It tends to be if you if you've got a good hard rock that hasn't that hasn't changed much in in that time. This is a really cool piece because of all the uh, kind of crazy scoring on it. And and this is, might be an example of that where we we talked about as the rock rebounds, it does it does uh, uh, split. Uh, so you get fracturing, which is just because it's getting a chance to uh, it's getting a chance to expand, and that and that might cause some of the uh, some of the fracturing. So this pink is datum granite here. Yes, and and this actually now that we now that we get at it, so that yeah that right, looks yeah. dark right, over here. So, so we do have yeah, another yeah. set of rock which yeah. might be one of those dikes that we talked about where the granite there's the, this area started to rift and this might have ended up being the middle of the atlantic if it had actually if the continent had split right here and there are places where we get this all these diabase dikes that came up maybe not to the surface this would have still been a mountain on top of this uh, so it wasn't like it was a volcano that came through but it was splitting and magma was coming up so so this was potentially a rifting spot but then eventually it settled off in the middle of the Atlantic and, and this stayed Massachusetts. Avalonia, which is where we are on now, when it crushed into the rest of North America, not only was North America kind of bent out of shape by it, but even Avalonia took some, some hits on itself, yeah. uh, and, and rocks were tilted, and in fact, the, the conglomerate uh, throughout the Boston Basin, the Roxbury conglomerate, which starts on the other side of the tracks, not up here, um, is, you look at it, and when people who have mapped it, you can see that it's got folds in it, which is crazy, right? I mean, it's a conglomerate, so how do you spot a fold? But <laughs> they, there are ways, and um, and they've even been able to identify different members. Like if like there's a thing called the squantum member, and hopefully that's not offensive, but that is what it, geologically it is. The squantum member is uh, from Squantum Point in down in um, uh, down on Boston Harbor. Uh, that that member can be traced for miles back all the way to Natick. And uh, it's a separate layer, and then they find it again down toward Westwood, meaning that it's all, it's been actually bent into a big syncline. So even Avalonia took a hit when, when it collided with North America. 